That's the, that's my Squidward walking noise, and uh, oh, would you see there's a map? Wow, isn't that cool? So kids, where does Squidward want to go to? A, Kent Hovind's ER Creation Seminar. B, Dinosaur Adventure Land. Or C, that filthy Christian college full of atheist professors that are going to seduce him with philosophy. Wait, Squidward, no, wrong choice. I'm sorry, dad. I'm a free thinker and I, I don't want to be a KJV onlyist anymore, dad. I don't want a heretical view of the Trinity anymore, dad. I think the plain reading of the text is insufficient. Dad! Stop! Is this your son? Is it, are these your kids? What did you- what did you do? What did you do wrong? You need to put your kids on a leash. They are out of control. They are getting seduced by <laughs> filthy philosophy. You thought it would be a good idea to send your child to Bible college. Because surely they teach the good Christian faith there. Oh. Bible colleges are full of atheist professors because they want to be seen as <coughs> progressive to the world and thus acceptable. They aren't acceptable. No, you have ruined your child's faith and you should have- No, no. I should have warned you that theology will ruin your faith. And you know what? Let's just talk about that now. In this video, we're going to discuss Will theology ruin your faith? Yes, it will. But where does that idea come from? From here, we're going to discuss what validity this phrase has to it, to which we will then conclude by asking, is there a solution? Which there isn't. So with that in mind, you just go get your son back from those filthy professors that are gonna twist the plain reading of the texts. Go on, give them a wee talking to you. That'll teach them. <laughs> then they'll know what's what. I... I'm... 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 I'm John. Stop it. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. We're gonna ask, what do you think? Do you like thinking? Do you like engaging your brain, make those oh, juices swirl? I love thinking. Don't you know that thinking, especially critically, is damaging to your faith? In the previous video, you're gonna remember that we discussed the levels at which we all do theology. This, as we discussed, is a spectrum of reflection. We're going to assume that you know what I'm talking about and that I don't need to re-explain things. You could probably make a guess as to who I might say would make the statement that theology will ruin your faith. Could it be folk theologians? Ding, ding, ding. Yes. Folk theology is the only level of doing theology which rejects critical reflection. And based on our definition for theology, that it is reflecting on topics which ultimately point back to God, you could see why a folk theologian may reject theology itself because it is so deeply inclined with critical reflection. But the opposite, why is it that a folk theologian might want to reject critical reflection? Good question, you. When a folk theologian gets all their theology from informal traditions, and when these traditions make up the bulk of their faith, the faith itself and the folk traditions can become conflated with each other. You, at some point, can't really have one without the other for the folk theologian. As such, when you challenge a folk theologian's informal traditions, it can feel like the faith itself is being challenged. And for the folk theologian to compromise on one's own informal traditions is also the same as compromising on one's own faith. But I also think we'll explain the very phrase that theology will ruin faith. Ironically, for some folk theologians who might take very seriously the Bible and sin, this right here is my favorite thing. This doesn't really take into account, as Capic argues, two key realities. That we are limited in our knowledge through our finitude and our sin. Our finitude is limiting us because we can't know everything. Unless you're this man. Thou shalt not eat beans. And our sin is limiting us because even if you could know everything, there are all these fancy ways which sin can convince us that we are in fact correct. No, you're not correct. You're actually wrong. wrong. This is something that we're going to try and keep in mind as we're going through the possibility that theology might ruin your faith. So, next segment. Oh man, oh god, oh man, oh god, oh man, oh god. Oh, hello little Timmy. Are you going to school, kid? 
Yeah, Mom. I'm going to school. Oh, that's wonderful, little Tim. Oh, let me let me give you this lunchbox and uh, you go eat your lunch at school. No thanks, Mom. I'm gonna go buy food from the cafeteria. <sighs> Why would you do this to me, little Timmy? I made you that lunch. Why are you substituting it with cafeteria food? Stop. Is this your son? Did you let him have cafeteria food? Well, no, no. Old habits, ugh, they die hard. Maybe theology's not too bad. I mean, maybe cafeteria food's not too bad. Why am I saying cafeteria food? Good cafeteria food isn't all that bad. Actually, it can be quite good. It's very nutritious, but it can be a little expensive sometimes. But someday you're gonna need to learn to Cook for yourself. Cookbooks. Do you like cookbooks? Do you like learning? That's great. But if you start eating the cookbook, what's that gonna do for you? That's not nutritious. That is what happens when you substitute your faith for your theology. Why would you do that? If you remember, in a previous video, we discussed very briefly that theology can be a substitute for faith. This is an objection some people have to theology, and we concluded that this isn't true. Theology is not a substitute for faith. Rather, it is a supplement, a fine mwah, armor for faith. However, it might blow you away to discover that some people do treat theology like it's a substitute. Mm, cringe! But it's true. Gorenz and Olsen discuss in one of their chapters that the task of theology is to critique and construct beliefs about God. If you're like me, you can find the process of doing theology whew, exhilarating. But unfortunately, sometimes you can get so involved in the critique and the construction that you forget what the purpose of all of this is in our lives. Sometimes we can trivialize theology by making it only about the solving and setting of conundrums as Capic states. And by consequence, we can trivialize our very religion when we dissolve away the piety and practices of devotion. But theocracy, I don't want to do that. I don't want to forget about my piety and my devotion. That's good. That is... Mm. But it's a reality that we have to be aware of. You know, you, you just wake up someday and you make your breakfast and then you start doing theology and... Ooh, I'm learning things. It's so cool. Oh man, I can read the text like this instead of this ugly little Stop. thing over there? That's brilliant! Oh man, that's exciting. And all of a sudden, I've not been praying for like 12 years. All of a sudden, I just couldn't be bothered hanging out with my Christian pals in devotion with each other that, ah, uh, do I believe anymore? Am I a Christian anymore? I don't remember. In the freezing of the issue of theology substituting faith, there can exist this assumed distinction which might dichotomize theology from your faith. Some might think that theology is way over here and my faith is way over here. That these two people, they don't really know each other. They never come round to the, each other's houses this for tea anytime. They're just kind of acquaintances. When that's not the truth. Rather, whilst theology and faith are in fact two different things, they're not equal. However, primarily, theology is the servant to this one. So, for there to be any substitution in the first place, I don't really think demonstrates any kind of problem with theology itself, but rather it demonstrates a problem with how we treat theology and how we practice our theology. When we forget about our devotion and piety in respect to God, that's not a theology problem, that's a how we treat theology problem. And so this is one thing that we ought to be aware of when we are engaging theologically. Keep practicing your devotion, keep, you know, hanging out with your Christian buddies and keep praying. Easy. Easy peasy. One of these will be eternal life and a home in heaven. I am so smart. I am the smartest person in this room. I know so many things that you don't know. No one knows at this party that I know so many things, but I know, I know those things. I know that in Genesis chapter one, and God said, let's create them in our image. He wasn't talking in the Trinity. He was talking to the divine council. I know this because mm, I'm smart. <sighs> I'm so lonely.
Superiority complexes. It, they can happen, you know? Just sometimes you just get so smart and you just think you're so great and I am better than you. Yeah, of course I am. No! Stop thinking that you're having a superiority complex moment. And sometimes it can be the case that theology can lead to a kind of big headedness. Just having knowledge, knowledge. kind of just makes you feel special, kind of just makes you feel like you're the, the chosen, chosen one. one. Theology, anywhere you go. So, here's an argument. One, theology leads to knowledge which causes big headedness. Two, we as Christians are called to be humble. Three, big headedness is pride. Four, therefore, we should not practice theology because theology will create pride. Bulletproof. I'll never do theology because I don't want to be prideful. I'm aware that Paul could be cited to argue that theology puffs up. Because theology provides knowledge, therefore theology will lead to this puffing up. Some real life examples of this very thing happening could be found in people who are new to Calvinism. You know, those people who are just all zealous and they love the doctrines of grace and all of a sudden are so obnoxious that they have to turn every little conversation into an argument for the doctrines of Calvinism. You're at your grandmother's dinner table, she's just talking about her day, all of a sudden you start yelling at her, woman, you were predestined to have this conversation with me, you could not help yourself. This zealous obnoxiousness that new Calvinists experience is what's called cage stage Calvinism. Greg Dutcher, a Calvinist, confesses this about when he could have been defined as a cage stager. To my shame, I have literally made others cry with my lack of tact. At times, my arrogance and insensitivity have burned like jet fuel, while I smugly justified it all because I was, was standing, standing up, up for, for the, the truth. truth. I have damaged friendships, ruined Bible studies, strained prayer, prayer, prayer meetings, and actually mocked what? people who could not come to terms with what I believe to be true. People who are new to the study of theology may hold aspects in common with cage stage Calvinism. They can be zealous and they can be obnoxious about their new theological knowledge and as such can turn elementary conversations into an argument. People who've watched me develop theologically eh, could probably say the same thing about me. As Capic outlines, theology is a very deeply emotional venture that doesn't really leave a lot of room for detachment. Consequently, the journey of theological reflection can be quite an emotive one, whether you like that idea or not. Now, I, I do think it makes sense that some people would become obnoxious in their theology. However, this isn't just a problem for us. The obnoxiousness when perceived by other people who don't explicitly practice theology might cause them to run, not want to touch that thing with a pole. As such, people who don't really understand theology all that well when they see us acting like uh, animals, they might think the theology is the problem. However, again, like the previous section, I don't think this is a theology problem. I think this is a how we are treating theology problem. It's not necessarily true that knowledge will cause big headedness, but it is something that we need to be aware of when we are engaging theologically. Just, uh, just keep that one in the back of your brain. Boop, boop. Beep, beep. Next segment. Next time on Gohan's muscles erupt with his newly bridled power. Theology will ruin faith. Please protect the life I loved. <gasps> Yet another Christian you could have saved. And I won't watch this anymore. Gohan has awoken. Now fundamentalist. Will theology ruin your fear? Is there a solution? On the next Dragon 